When I returned from the memory orb, I was no longer on the secluded bench outside some restrooms where I had laid down to view it. I was someplace else, dark and cold. The black book floated in front of me in the darkness, just an afterimage of what was already fading. A spotlight flared to life above me, its beam pinning me to the ornate purple and pink marble floor as it destroyed any adjustments my eyes were trying to make to the darkness. I brought up my EFS, detecting only half a dozen figures in the shadows around me. According to my EFS compass, they were not hostile, but I relaxed but slightly, considering I had apparently been abducted. Hello? I asked, not trying to keep the annoyance from my voice. Who are you, and what do you want? I immediately suspected they wanted me to do something, some task to perform, some new distraction that would further divert me from my date with the Canterlot Ruins. If so, they were in for disappointment. I chose when and if I strayed off course. And I'd done it too much already. There was a clock ticking. There was a bomb poised to destroy the very tower and every pony in it. And I didn't have time for games. A pony trotted, uh, trotted forward, concealed in the full robe. Under his hood, his face was cast into black shadows by the light from above. But the folds of his hood made it clear that he was a unicorn. And enough light bounced up from the marble floor to recognize a mottled brown coat. Greetings, little Pip, said a familiar voice that I couldn't quite place. The voice had the tones of a refined gentle stallion that shied away from sounding too haughty. I apologize for the rude awakening. <clears throat> we who? I asked, but I knew that already. We call ourselves the Twilight Society, the gentle stallion proclaimed. I forced myself to ask, or not to ask, if he was kidding. Very enigmatic. And who are you, really? I said, biting back deep sarcasm. And what do you want? The unicorn under the hood restrained a, a chortle. He whined. Why, that is exactly correct. You too have enigmatic titles, do you not, stable dweller, wasteland heroine? We have been told that you are the savior of the wasteland and the bringer of light. I cringed. Those were not titles that I wanted, nor ones I'd ever thought of myself worthy of. And now I was under a spotlight being judged for a reputation I couldn't control and couldn't live up to. What we want, the gentle stallion continued, is to know who you are, really. I snorted. And you kidnapped me to find out. You could have just asked. These conversations are not for prying ears, another voice said from the darkness to my left. You have already been places you were not meant to be. Shown things no pony was meant to reveal, a third voice said, this time to my right. Suddenly, I was worried for homage. She'd clearly broken the rules of this overly dramatic group of ponies to help me. What might they do in response? Murmurs rippled through the darkness around me. You have used your own goals, the very secrets that we hold guardianship over. Oh. I know too much, right? Is that it? That is but half of what it is, the gentle stallion said, addressing me. We have been counseled uh, to make available to you the full might and mystery of this place. We have not yet made our decision. Yet, you have availed yourself to our secrets anyway. You are a risk, claimed the voice from my right. Not only to us, but to all that could one day be accomplished with what we guard here. I stomped. Bullshit. I've heard this crap before. Two hundred years, and you've done nothing with what you have here. I turned, advocating towards the source of the voice on my right. A cloaked pony, hiding under a hood as he hid in the shadows. He backed up, briskly nervous. You're hiding your secrets away because they're special, I spat. And they make you feel special and important. Not because you're ever going to put them into use to make a difference. 
Ten Pony Tower is a bastion of civilization in the wilderness. The gentle stallion commented sincerely. I would suggest we have done quite a lot. Yeah, it is. But that's it. Or that isn't you, is it? I rounded on him. You only... The only damned one of you doing any good at all is... I paused before I said her name. Is DJ Pwn3. At least she can keep a secret. Niggered yet a fourth voice from somewhere behind me. We are only the most recent inheritors of these secrets. You are unwise to judge us by the failures of those in generations past, the gentle stallion said. I frowned, biting my tongue. He had a point. And perhaps you are right, the gentle stallion said earnestly. Perhaps it is time for us to make a greater use of what is hidden here. But to do so carries great risk, not only for the greedy and wicked outside the gates, but from within. Who can we trust to guide the use of this power and these resources? Who can we know will not become corrupted by it? I sighed heavily. What do you want from me? I asked. How can I persuade you that I'm not going to become the next Red Eye if, you, if I'm giving you help? Your memories. I jolted with shock. Wh what? You had several memories or several days of memories extracted earlier today, from within our own secluded chambers. We would acquire access to these memories. They wanted my memories. A chunk of my life. One that even I didn't know the contents of. No, I stomped. Those are my memories. They're private. We could ask you who you are, but you would not only tell us what you want us to hear. The perceptions of others are fragments, and heavily colored by their own perceptions. How better could we possibly learn who you really are? I fumed. I didn't want to trust something so precious to these strangers. I didn't trust them. I trusted homage. That was all. Plus, it felt wrong, like a violation, which I knew was hypocritical at best considering how much time I've spent playing with the things and the memories of others. The voice on my left intoned. We already know that Red Eye is threatening this tower and the lives of every pony in it to motivate you. If you are playing with our lives, do you not think we at least deserve to know what the score is? I stopped fuming, considering that. Finally, I took a deep breath. Will I get them back? If the answer was no, the deal was off. And of necessity, I would fight my way out of here. Of course, the gentle stallion told me. Fine, then yes, but on two conditions. Underneath his robe, the gentle stallion cocked his head. And what conditions would those be? One, the memories do not leave Homage's possession. I trust her to guard them. So far, I have no reason to trust, to trust any of the rest of you. Agreed. And two? Hamid continues to live here as long as she wants, safe from any repercussions for having helped me or for revealing what she did. More murmurs, unhappy ones. Non-negotiable, I said, hoping I had this card to play. What if they decided that they really weren't that interested in me after all? But the gentle stallion answered, agreed, with a sigh of relief. Conditionally, I felt my heart skip a, bit, skip a beat. The rogue pony elaborated. No action will be taken against homage until all of us have had the opportunity to view the memory orbs. Should what the reveal of your character and methods persuade us to deem you as an asset rather than a threat, then no action will be taken against her, and the record of her misdeeds will be expunged. If, however, your memories prove you to be a menace to our society and this tower as a whole, then homage will be judged accordingly. I knew I'd be agreeing to this. I'd be putting my memories in jeopardy, running the risk that I might never see them again. But in the end, what else could I do? My memories 
were a small price to pay compared to the potential rewards. I prayed that I had at least a shred of the sort of character that DJ Pwn3 attributed to me. I was relying on myself to have been a decent pony. I was given the memory orbs again, and instructed to lose myself in it, while they returned me back to the bench where they took me from. All of which seemed utterly silly to me, but I went along anyway. I suspected Life Bloom was with them, and that made me feel just a touch safer, if only because Homage and Velvet seemed to think well of them. When I came to out of the memory orb for the second time, the feeling of deja vu was almost enough to make me wonder if I had imagined the Twilight Society. I wonder how often ponies in Tempony Tower suddenly found those days interrupted and what, the tempo and what the Twilight Society used when there wasn't a convenient memory orb to play. Revisiting the orb in the wake of my odd abduction had left me thinking about secrets, about the dis... word of information. Covert operations depending on secrecy for the safety of those involved but it seemed cruel for Rainbow Dash and Pinkie Pie to leave Applejack and Rarity in the dark about Sakura, believing that a close friend of theirs had betrayed them. Was it necessary to cause them that pain? Could they have been trusted with the secret? Everything I had been or seen suggested that Rarity was well practiced in keeping secrets, but Applejack? How convincing was the bearer of the element of heart, honesty to be, if put into a position, where she had to maintain a lie. Was it better for every pony, and one zebra, if she did not know? I packed the memory orb up, checked my pit buck to make sure the other one was still with me, and all my equipment was still in the proper place. And then, getting up, I started to walk down the hallways, away from the bathrooms. My mind was still engaged in contemplation. Likewise, it was clear from several previous memories that the mares knew the truth about zebra religion, or at least knew enough about their thoughts regarding Nightmare Moon to try and use them against them. But Steelhooves had been blindsided by the idea. Clearly, a decision that had made been made by the heads of the government not to inform the general population, or even the lower ranks. I found myself second-guessing that decision, even though I could understand why. How demoralizing would it have been to that knowledge have been? Would knowing have served any positive purpose? Littlehorn was such a painful horror, the massacre of a school full of ponies, ch children, and left a blank, or black and weeping wound in the psyche of Equestria. Littlehorn had surely been a point of no return for both sides. At that point, I wondered if the ponies had been any more capable of surrender than the zebras were. A zebra dropped in front of me. I jumped back. Already floating out little Macintosh, my heart pounding. But recognition struck, and relief passed over me. Zenith, you scared me. Flustered, I hastily slid a little Macintosh back into its holder. I mean, uh, you broke my train of thought. Brave little pony, she intoned. Where have you been hiding? Hiding, she said simply. When they took you, I followed. But they did not seem to hurt or threaten you, so I did not act. I suddenly felt a lot better about the day's strange interlude. At the same time, I realized that I needed to speak to Homage and let her know what was coming, if she didn't already. I'm going to see Homage, I said, if adding, not adding, if she'll let me. Are you okay? Following? I remember the zebra's discomfort with, with my Homage, I wondered if that was why I hadn't seen her all day. Well, that and her ability to hide like a living stealth buck. And on ceilings, no less. If you wish. I stopped. Well, what do you wish? It does not matter, Zenith informed me. I am not welcome here, so I cannot do as I wish. Far too many. My stripes make me an enemy. Or worse. A demon from the past responsible for all the misery of this world. That's unfair. It does not matter what's this fair. It is. Is. She looked down. Sometimes, I feel as if I'm an earth pony, and that my stripes 
are really great wounds, a punishment of some great wrong the ancestors and my ancestors were connected to. I shuddered, as much as the pain and resignation in her voice as the mental image her words conjured. There had to be something I could do. If you could do anything, what would you want to do the most? I would like to go shopping, Zena said. She smiled at my surprise. What? Everyone likes to shop. I'd like to be able to stride into a store, look around, greeting the sales ponies, and make purchases, all while being treated only as rudely as every other pony customer is. I could feel a little rocked from the normally or normality of this request. I tried to imagine how it must have been to not even be able to go into a store to buy. I couldn't, and I felt awkward for it. Surely, there had to be a way to fix this. We could dye her coat a new color, Homage suggested, as she floated a huge painting of Splendid Valley away from her safe. She was moving my box of memory orbs to another location, so that she didn't have to reveal the safe when the Twilight Society came for them. A near-black charcoal would hide her beautiful stripes enough for a modest gown and hat to obscure them completely. Although, for the life of me, I can't imagine wanting to do that. Homage turned and smiled warmly to Zenith. You're gorgeous the way you are. Zenith scowled. I'm being honest, Homage insisted. I'm sure my little Pip has drank in the sight of you at least once, haven't you, little Pip? She asked, deliberately putting me into a humiliating spotlight. All the worse, because I immediately thought of staring at Zenith's flanks back at Stable 2. See? Homage laughed. That burning face means little Pip has been watching you. Zenith was staring at me. I sunk to the floor, putting my fore hooves on my head. After an excruciating moment, Zenith replied, I am a zebra, and they scarred one at that. Yes, Homage agreed, unlocking her safe. And a beautiful, sexy mare of a zebra at that. A simple glamour should then mask your zebraness from notice, Homage suggested, as she swung the door of her safe open. But are you sure you want to hide who and what you are like this? I hide all the time, Zena says simply. This is no diff. Zenith made a slightly choking noise. Backing up, her eyes fixed on something just beyond Homage. At her reaction, we both followed her gaze. The Star Blaster. You have it locked away like a treasured possession, Zenith intoned. Homage frowned. I have it locked up to keep it away from hurting any pony. Zenith frowned. The zebra cast a look to me as she slowly asked. Then you know that the June's to kill. Homage gave me a quick, quizzical look. I tried to return it with an expression that told her Zenith was deadly serious in the claim. Homage didn't laugh. She didn't look like she found the idea even a little funny. I'll admit, I'm a much better shot with that thing than I've ever been with any other weapon I've tried, including other magical energy weapons. But I'll attribute that to magical energy weapons being damn rare in most part of the question of Wasteland, and all the others I've tried being poorly maintained pieces of rubbish. Zenith remains silently waiting. No, I don't think it actually wants to kill. I don't believe the thing is alive, or sentient, Homage told her. But I do believe that it was made by crafters with murderous intentions. Crafters? Zenith asked. It's a complex, techno-magical tool. I don't think the stars just willed it into existence. Someone or something made it. She looked at the zebra. Isn't that how the stars work? They help guide people to their own destruction. I was starting startled by the response. I remembered how that it was Homage who first spoke to me of the zebra's mythology, and she had spoken as one who simply put some cadence into the notions. Then you believe as we do? Zenith asked slowly. 
I believe that mostly all religion is born of a mixture of truth and fantasy, hope and fear. How much truth is in it, as is the one mythology, is hard to say. How much pulled the box full of memory orbs from the safe, before closing it again, sealing the weapon from the stars away with it? But I believe the amount of truth in the Zero's legends is a good bit more a good bit more than zero. I don't believe that your ancient ancestors understood the stars nearly as much as they believed they did. How much look to me, addressing us both? But I've seen enough to be certain that the void beyond the moon holds wonders and terrors far beyond our imaginations. And that at least some of what is out there is malicious beyond our contraption of evil and is looking this way with hostile intentions. I've changed my mind, claimed the exotic voice of the charcoal black earth pony next to me, who was really Zenith. I like her. Zenith, the not a zebra, was peering into the jars of strangely or strange things floating in stranger liquids that lined the back shelf of the secluded apothecary, which crouched around a corner from the main stores, like it was a little colt hiding from bullies. The proprietor kept shooting us nasty looks but I felt they were more directed at me than Zenith. She was dressed in a gown of subtle goldenrod and lily, an ivy, with a matching wide-brimmed hat. The entire ensemble made her look not only lovely, but right at home amongst the fine ladies and gentle stallions of Tempony Tower. I looked like me. Like who? I asked before I realized the obvious, obvious answer. Homage? I suddenly felt giddy. The not, a the not a zebra nodded with a smile. I wanted to dance around, shouting yes, but I was already getting enough looks from the proprietor. Zenith had clearly been enjoying her evening, strolling openly down the streets, passing through crowds and sitting down at some restaurants, and being served by the s same snobbish waiters, paying the same unreasonable prices as everybody else for confections made of sweet potato pudding and deep-fried applesauce. More than once, some pony had snidely suggested she'd take me to a dress shop, and gave her sympathetic looks, as if I was a younger relative she had been burdened with, and my appearance was some sort of youthful rebellion. Sometimes, I hated being small-framed. The selection here is wonderful, Zenith commented, but I had not expected such high prices. In case you haven't noticed, miss, the standing behind the counter grumbled, we're not getting any fresh product anytime soon. It's a seller's market. The prices of everything in Tempony Tower had tripled since the first time we were here. Red Eye's blockade was killing commerce with the caravans and scavengers. I could feel an undercurrent of worry in the marketplace. Earlier, a mare had snorted, exclaiming, the mere thought of the wines meant for my cellar being sold instead to one of those dirty little places like Gutterville or Arbu gives me the vapors. I had remembered how much I really don't like the company of these ponies. Shouts from outside drew our attention. Zena smiled politely to the stallion, glaring from behind the counter, saying, We'll be right back. He didn't look like he believed it, and scowled at me, as if I had intentionally wasted his time. Backing away from him, I turned to follow Zenith out of the shop. Ladies and gentle stallions gathered by the nearest outside windows in small crowds, prim and proper young fillies and colts squirming about, and climbed on their parents, momentarily forgetting proper decorum as they tried to get a peek. Zenith, revealing her ability to talk with the strangers, asked, What's the commotion? It surprised me not for the first time. How easily she blended in now, that the perceived stigma of her race had been obscured. The slavers, a colt replied, as he quickly trotted past us, heading towards a window. They're leaving! I don't like this, I told Zenith, as we stood at one of the windows looking down through the darkness of one early night. Early night. The burning light of torches drifted away from the base of Tempony Tower, like rivets of lava. Over half of Red Eye's forces were pulling out. 
The only reason I could think for Red Eye to withdraw forces before I fulfilled my end of the bargain was that he decided to blow the tower anyway. Now. But then, would he not remove all of his men? Zenith asked cautiously. Not if he wanted to make sure we weren't able to evacuate, I suggested. Although I realized it didn't make much sense. I couldn't think of another reason for this behavior. Perhaps it is part of your cunning plan, Zena suggested hopefully. Doesn't feel like it. Aren't I supposed to be punished? I asked, sitting on Homage's bed inside Twilight Sparkle's anatheum, staring out of huge windows at the retreating forces. I was tense and worried. I wanted to know what Red I was up to. He was making a move. And while I had nothing to, nothing but a gut instinct to base my options, opinions on, it didn't feel like this was something I had predicted. Throughout the tower, ponies were cautiously optimistic. I gave up, Homage admitted, as she sat down behind me and began to massage my shoulders, working to relieve my tension. Zenith had convinced me not to assume the worst, but that didn't keep me from contemplating all the other avenues were bad. Homage's gentle hooves worked in circles over my shoulders and down my spine, towards my flanks. I couldn't hold back a sigh. And my eyes flew open as a dark thought struck my brain like a dagger. Homage! You know I've been tainted, right? The goddesses only know what the vile stuff did to me. I might be... abnormal now. Homage giggled softly. Not at all the response I expected. Love she said, sending a thrill up my spine. You've already had this conversation. Oh, I said, feeling embarrassed. How much planned the kisses upon the length of my mane? The highlights. Both Dr. Helping Hoof and Life Bloom have given you a look over. There's a tiny mutation, but it's benign. Nothing to worry about. She gave one of my ears a nibble. The fact that you risked taint for me and the ponies of this tower has not gone unnoticed, or unappreciated, especially by me. I felt relief. The dagger in my brain melted away. I've even checked you over myself, quite thoroughly, and you definitely are still my little pip. My ears shot up as she whispered, Orb number eight. I held homage in my forelegs, nuzzling her softly. She leaned into me, her body warm, her breathing pleasantly heavy. Homage, I asked, with tepidation. I didn't want to spoil the night. Yes, love, Homage's sweet voice panted gently up to me. Are you doing all right? After that? Oh, yes. She giggled. I tickled her absently, enjoying the ability to just touch her. You know what I mean. Things here have been rough lately, and a few days ago, what you had to do to save us. Homage sighed and curled around to look at me even though we couldn't really see each other in the darkness. After all you've been through for me, you're still more worried about me than yourself. That was a dodge, and I wasn't going to let her get away with it. Don't change the question. Joke Blue was usually the one doing the shooting, Homage admitted. I've only taken a life a few times, not counting beasts and robots, but each time it was to save some pony, although sometimes that pony was myself. She reached a hoof up to brush my muzzle. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. And I'm not really good at it, but I don't regret it. The next morning, a light rain had begun to drizzle, spotting the windows and making the gray on gray of the Manhattan ruins into a monochromatic haze. I had used my binoculars to search the ground below, startled, uh, startled to find out that only a third of Red Eye's forces remained, but they looked like they were camped out permanently. My heart felt heavy, and my mind was foggy from the lack of sleep. The latter being entirely Homage's fault. Not that I minded. Not even slightly. 
but I was beginning to feel guilty for the amount of attention she lavished on me compared to the other way around. I couldn't do anywhere near the things to her that she could do to me, and I was beginning to feel inadequate in comparison. I'd reached the point where I was going to have to start asking her for instructions, a request that no matter how I tried to phrase it in my head, I always sounded pathetic rather than romantic. The little red wagon squeaked along behind me. I stopped as I reached the door to our suite. This time, I raised a hoof and knocked. Twice. Calamity opened the door, smiling. Howdy, little pip. Morning. Good morning to you too, Calamity. I see you're in a good mood. Oh, yep. Are we ready to do this? Calamity grinned. I reckon she's been ready for a day, a few days now. He flapped his wings, scooting out of the way. Velvet Remedy lay on the edge of her bed, and Calamity's now. I was willing to bet. Her plaster-bound legs stretched out uncomfortably in front of her. Her eyes widened as she caught sight of the wagon, then narrowed. What exactly is that for? Today's the big day, I said sweetly. Ready to go to the clinic and get that cast removed? I can remove it myself, Velvet Remedy hissed, and you're not hauling me around in that. I wrapped her in a telekinetic blanket and floated my uniform friend in the air. Put me down. Doc's orders, Clamity reminded Velvet. Help me who wants to get a good look at your leg to make sure everything's sealed proper. We're your friends, I chimed in as she waved her legs helplessly in the air. We insist that you get the best treatment and won't let you skip out of it. You've always given us the best care and often short-charged yourself for your own. Not this time. I floated her down onto the wagon. She tried sticking her legs down and pushed away, but with her cast, it was a looting battle. Finally, she tucked her three good legs in and settled on to the little wet, ra wet wagon. You're enjoying this, aren't you? Yep, I said with a smile. I turned and strode out of the door, pulling her slowly through the halls towards the elevator in the very same wagon she had once hauled me in to the very same place. You were right, I told Velvet, as Dr. Helping Hoof did one final examination on my friend's foreleg. It was a slim scar that encircled her leg. It wouldn't even be visible with her coat when it had grown back. Velvet Remedy looked up at me as she flexed her forelegs in every possible way at the doctor's insistence. Life Bloom was standing nearby, his horn glowing as a spell allowed Helping Hoof to examine the inner workings of Velvet's leg. You said I can't be trusted. I reminded her. She sighed heavily and started to say something that would surely have been comforting, but I didn't let her. I needed to say this. And where part of time mentals are concerned, you are right. I can't be trusted. I frowned, trying to push the words out of my muzzle, knowing I had to. I don't know how I really need them. There's a chance I never will. She didn't know the context of that. Only Homage and Zenith knew my memories were now being revealed by the Twilight Society. But I do know that when confronted with the chance to slip some into my saddlebags, I wasn't strong enough. Velvet Remedy was looking at me sadly. So, from now on, I need you to do what you said you would. Go through my things. Check my pit buck. Maybe Life Bloom can teach you a PTM detection spell. Whatever it takes. I trembled a little, hearing the tone of begging creeping in my voice. Please. I want your help. I need it. Slowly, Velvet nodded. Of course, little Pip. Well, Dr. Helping Hoof announced. I'd say you've made a miraculous recovery, young lady. You're fit to go. She looked at Calamity. You can settle up the bill with Life Bloom on your way out. Comedy nodded, wrapping his recently wounded wing around Velvet in a snug. Looking to me, he asked, So, where to next? I pressed my lips together, thinking. Cantalot Ruins are our new goal, but we have a few places to visit along the way. The village that Zenith believes her daughter lives in is on our way. 
But first, we need to arm ourselves with all the information we can on surviving the Pink Cloud. And that means our next trip will be back to Stable 29. The others nodded in agreement. We need steel hooves. It was a particularly beautiful day in Ponyville. The sun was shining, pouring a warmth down over the equestrian village that cheered both the land and the soil. Only a few clouds spotted the sky, and a mint green pegasus flew about overhead, belatedly kicking them away. Below, a brightly colored ponies trotted about the day on their daily business, often stopping to give neighborly hellos to those they passed on the street. A trio of bunnies darted through the bushes, carrying radishes pilfered from someone's garden. Oh my, Fluttershy said, watching through strands of pink mane as the bunnies darted between her legs. For a moment, she seemed ready to break away from the other ponies she was walking with to fly after them. New fellow's doing all right, Applejack commented, looking up at the sky. But it just ain't the same without Rainbow Dash. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, Twilight Sparkle told her, floating a letter out of her saddlebags. I got a letter from the princess today. She says that Rainbow Dash it isn't just on vacation. She signed up for the Equestrian Sky Guard. Poor dear took what happened to the Wonderbolts really hard, Rarity commented, adjusting her newest hat creation so the feathers all flowed with gentle summer breeze. I can't say I blame her. Yes, well, the princess doesn't want to see her get put in harm's way, but it wouldn't be right for her to tell Dash no. So, Twilight opened the letter as the others gathered around her, listening intently. Princess Celestia has given us a mission. We're to travel to the Buffalo and try to strengthen diplomatic ties with them. Give Rainbow Dash's previous experience with them, the princess feels that she would be the ideal envoy. Oh, goody! Pinkie Pie bounced. I've been working on my song, and I think... Oh, hey no, moaned Applejack. Oh, dear, winced Rarity. Um, um, Fluttershy. No singing, Twilight Sparkles said sternly. But, no singing, she repeated. Princess's orders. Ah. Twilight, darling, Rarity asked, concerned. Did Princess Celestia say exactly why we are strengthening diplomatic ties with the buffalo? I mean, other than to keep Rainbow Dash occupied. Twilight shook her head. A heavy silence fell over the group of friends that was distinctly at odds with the cheery brightness of the day. Applejack was the one who broke it. I heard talk of some of the folk at the Farmer's Expo last week. They're saying... She paused, as if scared the whole world she was thinking and would happen if you said them out loud. We might be a heading to war. Fluttershy gasped and disappeared behind a stump. But that's impossible, Applejack. Equestria has never known a real war. Twilight Sparkle paused, clearly running through her vast studies of Equestrian history and finding nothing. I don't think Equestria has ever had a war. At least, not in over a thousand years. Yeah, well, we all know how mighty stubborn ponies can get when their livelihoods are being treated or threatened. Only this time, I'm fear it ain't gonna be pies they're throwing. Big Mac brought home one of them newfangled firearms to take care of the cockatrice that's been attacking our pigs. Applejack was interrupted by an upset squeak from Fluttershy, who had been finally managing to come back out of the stump behind her. He wouldn't. Sorry, Fluttershy, Applejack said apologetically, but that thing was killing our pigs. Sometimes, you just got to take care of dangerous predators the hard way. You should have told me. I could have stopped him for you, Fluttershy said, uncharacteristically raising her voice, just a smidgen. Now your pigs will stay dead forever, you know. Only a cockatrice can reverse its own magic. And he would have, if I'd had a chance to tell him to. What? Applejack moaned. Nuts and shrews. Fluttershy turned meekly to Twilight Sparkle. There's not really going to be a... 
Her voice faltered at the word war, becoming barely a squeak. Will there? I hope not, Twilight said. I don't know what we'd do if there was. But people will get hurt. And animals. Fluttershy was trembling, just at the thought. We can't let that happen. We just can't. I think that's why the princess wants us to start talking with the buffaloes. Twilight said and surely. Well, whatever the reason, we'll do this together, Rarity asserted. Give me a few days to close up my shop, and I'll be ready for the trip. The others nodded. You're right. Ain't nothing we can't handle together, Applejack said, smiling at Rarity. Right, Twilight Sparkle said, back on firmer ground. Whatever the case, Princess Celestia has given us the mission, and we will not fail. This was familiar to her. She'd done this before, and she can do it again. Every pony, make whatever rain can you, you need to. We may be gone from Ponyville for a while. I'm going to get Rainbow Dash. Let's be back here in less than two days. The faith she had in her friends virtually radiated from her. All her friends nodded. Fluttershy, looking both exceptionally nervous and particularly determined. Then every pony galloped off, leaving the yellow pegasus standing on the path alone. Oh, so much to do, but we must not fail. We must not. Must not. Must not, she fretted. Who will take care of my animals? Can I help? My host asked, flying up to the distraught yellow pegasus. Oh! Fluttershy jumped, then crouched meekly, looking around until she spotted me. Oh, hello, Ditsy Doo. I didn't see you there. She looked away shyly. Um, sure, if you would like. I felt my host smile happily. Today was a good day. Footnote Maximum Level.